and welcome to We Are Not a Stereotype, Breaking Down Asian Pacific American Bias. Thank you for being here with us for this inaugural series of talks created for educators by educators. My name is Andrea Kim Neighbors, and I'm the manager of education initiatives at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center in Washington, D.C. We could not have made this talk and series possible without our brilliant speakers and educators, Suprita Petnisi and Takeru Naga Nagayoshi, who also goes by the name TK, uh, who we'll be hearing from shortly. We are grateful for the space they're creating with us to talk about queer and Asian identities. As Suprita, TK, and I are in different parts of the United States, we want to begin this talk acknowledging the people and lands our speakers are currently on. We would like to acknowledge the people of the land, past, present, and future. The Piscataway, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian Institution is located. The Lenape, the original stewards of the area commonly known as New Jersey, where TK is located. The Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Ottawa, the original stewards of the area commonly known as Chicago, where Sukhprita is located. We also want to take a moment to recognize those nations who are not acknowledged, yet occupy or have occupied the lands we teach on. I would also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors since the series would not be possible without their support. This project received federal support from the Asian Pacific American Initiatives Pool, as well as support from Expedia. We would like to thank them for sponsoring this series and for making this learning opportunity available for online for educators across the country. I'm now pleased to introduce Sukhprita Petnisi, activist, DEI capacity builder, teaching artist, and anti-racist, anti-bias educator, and Takeru Nagayoshi, AKA TK, the 2020 Massachusetts Teacher of the Year, educator, education coach, activist for education equity, and leadership consultant. They'll be talking about and breaking down queer and Asian identities. This video is a conversation between our speakers and includes video clips from interviews they've conducted. Thank you so much for that introduction, Andrea. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Suprita. Um, as Andrea shared, I use she, they pronouns and I, um, in my day job, so you kind of heard a little bit about my bio, but my day job, I um, work for a nonprofit called Teach for America, um, and I lead the Asian American and Pacific Islander Community Alliances there. So a lot of what my role does, or the intended vision for this role, is working with and alongside um, grass roots and grass tops organizations that are focused on strengthening, amplifying, and uplifting the talents and narratives of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. And my role in particular focuses on the educator um, community within that community. So super excited to be here. I'll turn it over to PK for him to introduce himself a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Takeru Nagayoshi, and I am a high school educator in New Bedford, Massachusetts, in the southern coast of the state of Massachusetts. I teach English and research, uh, and I'm really excited to be here uh, in terms of my identity as a Q&A or a queer and Asian person. I identify as a gay man and Japanese American. Uh, so I don't know if you said what your Q&A identity was, so I'm going to throw it back to you. Thanks for that. And, you know, I think that's going to come up in our dialogue later, why I focused on my role first and then wanted to go into Q&A after that. Um, but I identify as a bisexual, uh, queer woman, um, and I'm actually having moments of questioning my own, like, gender identity, too. Um, so I think for now, that is where I'm at with my identity, but I know it's always in progress. Thank you. And I also appreciate you going over gender pronouns. I uh, go by he, him pronouns. Um, so, I just wanted to give a little bit of context before we jump into what today's session is going to look like and uh, a bit about how we met. So uh, we actually met at uh, an AAPI uh, summit uh, full of developing educators who identify as Asian. And I remember a lot of the conversations that we had there centered on identity, obviously, but also uh, the identities that we don't always get to speak of. And as queer and Asian folks, uh, I think both identities tend to be uh, understood through a lens of invisibility and erasure. Um, and there is an inherent difficulty, right, around finding uh, spaces and communities to really reflect on what it means to not just be queer, not just be Asian, but really to be queer and Asian simultaneously. And so, A, just meeting you and being able to talk about that was amazing. Uh, but B, as we think about today's session, what does it mean for us uh, to really reflect together as a community and create that spaces because historically it's been deprived to us. 
Yeah, and I would add on to that. I think um, a lot of the, the things I try to do in my life is like connecting it back to like purpose. And a lot of my purpose comes in the form of people. Um, and so building relationships, finding folks like you and having these conversations have very, really, really like opened me up in many ways that like I wasn't expecting to um, at this time in my life. Um, if I could look back at uh, Suprita um, in, even in high school when Suprita was going by Victoria, that's another story y'all. Um, you know, I, I could have so many more things to say to myself um, to feel more empowered about actually showing up as me. And, you know, as, as far as the format is concerned, I really wanted to interview you, right? And ask you a lot of <laughs> questions. And so I think, you know, what we're going to be hearing is, is a podcast style dialogue uh, where we're going to be asking each other intimate questions and, and, and sort of build community uh, and space together to kind of reflect on the intersection of both of those identities. And so I'm not entirely sure where the conversations are going to go. Obviously, we came up with the questions together, um, but we don't know what the other person is going to respond to. And, and I hope that we can really dive into all sorts of topics, um, including but not limited to intersectionality, obviously, uh, what it means to be objectified or fetishized as a queer person, as an Asian person, uh, topics of invisibility, right? And, and our broader commitment to things like social justice. Yeah, and I, I appreciate this format too, because um, there's an inherent like vulnerability in it. And, you know, we, we shared with y'all that we met each other, we've known each other since February, but I feel like I've known TK for so much longer than that. But we wanted to kind of keep this conversation completely authentic and potentially model for y'all. Like, um, with you, if you wanted to take the questions that we are answering today and interviewing each other around, um, to interview someone in your life or even interview yourself um, and see how you respond to these. Um, we, we really encourage that um, because we know that there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences in just the way we identify as queer and Asian or Asian and then queer or maybe in a different, complete different order another day. Um, so bring your full self, however that is. Asian, non-Asian, straight, LGBTQ+, your, your intersections are always welcome. Um, I will call out, uh, you know, um, y'all know I identify as Lao American, TK is Japanese American, um, and we both shared a little bit about our gender and sexual identity here, but we don't and can't represent all the Q&A um, experiences, and that's kind of the point. Um, we are going to do our best to include multiple perspectives from folks who share aspects of both identities um, and kind of play their reflection back to you and then kind of comment on those uh, reflections at the same time. But we do want to call that out that, you know, this is a conversation between us. So um, it is going to be very specific to how we identify. And um, we, we hope that uh, what you take away from it also can be personalized to you. Thanks so much for that, Sue. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to get into the first question. Um, and I was thinking a lot about how I show up in places and, and what sort of identities feel uh, salient to me, um, depending on the context of the spaces that I'm in. And I, and I can definitely identify moments where I feel really Asian. I can definitely identify moments where I feel really queer, right, and gay, um, but seldom when they're both together. And so the first question that I have for you, Suk, is, you know, when is the last time that you felt both simultaneously queer and Asian? And, and what does that mean? Okay, yeah, that's a easy question right off the bat. No, um, but, uh, you know, thanks for asking this. And I think like something that I've been thinking a lot about is that um, I do believe that uh, I feel them both at the same time, but I actually feel the weight of them very differently depending on the circles that I'm in or the people that I'm around. So I, I introduced myself with my role. Um, Y'all probably heard, you know, I, I lead the Asian American Pacific Islander Community Alliances. So a lot of spaces that I do show up in, my Asianness is right there front and center and it's the first thing that is seen. It's the first thing that is discussed. It's often the first thing that um, I am even seen of being even, um, you know, this is such a um, seen as um, knowing things about um, or like can add a value add in. Um, but my bisexuality is something that is mostly unseen and even the ways I'm questioning my gender identity, I don't often bring up. Um, and it's one of those things where it's very personal to me that I do feel like I feel them both distinctly at the same time. But I, I, I see that when I move through the world um, that depending on how other people see me or what they can see about me or what they can perceive about my identity, um, the weight of them or like um, the weight of feeling both feels different. So sometimes I feel more pulled toward my Lao, my Asian identity, because those are just the circles I'm in and I'm seeing it as a way to kind of move through 
these circles. Example, right? Um, I uh, was at the summit with you where we met. It was a summit that was all Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian educators. And so that's how I chose to show up was first as that. Um, and then when we had an affinity group space for our unseen identities, um, I felt comfortable to say like, oh my gosh, and I'm queer. And it was one of those moments where folks were like, whoa, cool, I didn't know. And you know, it, it's, it's always that moment where people feel connected. But then I think about like, oh, if I feel so connected, why isn't that more obvious? Um, or why isn't that the, one of the first things I say? And um, I think it's also a little bit of my internalized biphobia that I push it to the side sometimes when I talk about my identity and feeling them both at the same time. Because, um, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, in my life, I have the privilege of passing as a straight person. Um, I'm in a pretty um, straight passing relationship as well. Um, and um, I even was trying to find the language to tell my parents that I was bi and Lao and I couldn't find it. And, you know, not being able to have that language started to make me feel farther away from that part of my identity, but it does not make it any less valid that it's a part of me. Um, the question of if I feel them at the same time, I really try to. Like, that's my hope, right? Like, because I know they exist at the same time, whether or not I actually feel them at the same time, mm -hmm. that, that for me is hard. Um, and so I, I feel like I feel them at the same time when I tell people and they see me for them at the same time, but not when I... You know, I think I need to get to a place where I can affirm myself that they're both there existing simultaneously and I'm allowed to feel them in that way. And, and, I, and I, I'm hearing in that that, that feeling is, is, is separate from the reality is that those intersections uh, and, and, and identities exist simultaneously all the time, but whether or not they're authenticated really depends on external structures for us. Um, I also really just appreciate you naming uh, erasure within uh, LGBT identities and specifically being a bisexual person, my partner also identifies as, um, you know, bi, a pansexual, and, and, and there are certain erasures that either we impose ourselves, right, or that society refuses to see or is not really authenticated. Um, when I was thinking about that question, you know, I was thinking about like, well, what are two domains that I feel like it constantly pops up in? And, and, and for me, I thought of dating immediately in terms of the intersections of queer and Asian, uh, then family as well. And so mm -hmm. dating, Really interesting, right? I, you know, especially in gay male circles, uh, there's a lot of anti-Asian sentiments. And uh, on, on one hand, that sometimes manifests as expectations that folks have around what it means to be a male person, a masculine mm. male person, and the performances that are bound with that kind of expression um, that are so Western and, and, and aligned around Western phenotypical ideals. Uh, and then on the other hand, right, you are sort of objectified uh, and fetishized based on stereotypes that folks have about Asian. And so when I was single and uh, in the dating scenes and in scenes where, you know, expectations around dating and romantic connections are there, I was very hyper vigilant about being queer and Asian at the same time. And so I wanted to name that. Um, but another one that I want to talk about was just family uh, and queerness. Uh, and so, uh, especially when, you know, you're first coming out and, and again, like this idea of salience of, of both simultaneously, they're kind of tied to certain milestones. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, my first struggle with family and coming out was finding the language. Um, my family speaks Japanese and, and uh, they are aware of the paradigm that we use in the United States to understand LGBT identities. Um, but even in Japan, being gay, for instance, right, being gay uh, is still understood, I think, for the most part as Euro-American centric. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that these concepts never existed, right? Uh, not being straight never existed in Japan before or our modern global LGBT movement, they certainly have. But queerness as an identity, uh, as a political identity specifically, uh, is something that my parents uh, at the time didn't really have quite the frame of reference for. And therefore, uh, I had that struggle uh, and, and, and encountered that difficulty. And so I'm going to throw it back to you around family in particular. I was yeah. wondering, yeah, did you feel it simultaneously as well? Oh, so much is coming up for me um, about family because, um, you know, I, I still feel this need to um, honor and protect my family's name. And sometimes I actually think I'm the one in the family who's always ruining it um, by exploring my identity. And I, and I say that um, not as like hyperbole, but like 
Um, and I laugh through it because I, I think sometimes I laugh through things like this because it's easier to laugh than it is to like actually like sit through the emotion and potentially cry on this webinar. Um, but I cry all the time and crying is okay. So if you want to cry, please do. Um, but I, I will share with my family what was really tough is that I grew up in a very um, matriarchal, Lao, like immigrant family where things were incredibly strict. Like you had your role to play and you played it with fidelity um, no matter what. Um, and I think when I was, you know, growing up and starting to understand a little bit more about who I was um, and I was watching, like, I remember watching a soap opera with my uh, sister, a Thai soap opera um, about um, men, men in drag. And I remember um, asking about that and saying like, oh, are these people like, is this like real? And, and I, I remember being that young and just asking, is this real? Because I didn't know that this could be a thing that like, um, Asian folks did. Um, and, and I think that was a callback to how little representation I saw um, in media about like queerness, um, just even in, in Asian like storylines and narratives. And so I remember asking my sister that and she was like, yeah, it is real. And it was just like kind of brushed away. And then when I started exploring my own sexual identity and I was trying to find the language um, in Lao to share with my parents, like, I think I'm bisexual and I, I want to like you know, and then I like practice being like, no, I am bisexual. Like I just was like practicing with my language. Um, I remember my mom saying like, um, okay, sure. Um, and it was one of those moments where I felt it so distinctly at the same time, like these two identities, um, but I felt them because they were in conflict um, with each other. And, and I don't know if I felt them harmoniously simultaneously. I felt them like at odds and I could feel the at oddness because my, um, my mom um, definitely was just so confused. Um, and so I, th I think like that was one of the things I often think about is like with my family, you know, um, I, I, I don't realize the impact that I've had on them until years and years later when they will say something or they'll send me an article and suddenly I'm like, oh, you were listening 10 years ago when I shared this thing with you. Um, and uh, I think now um, what I've been trying to understand is when I do show up in my family spaces, how do I make sure that like, regardless of um, whether or not I am like saying it out loud that they know that these two identities exist within me at the same time? Um, and how do I honor um, their understanding, growing understanding of it, but also honor myself and not wanting to like backtrack and say that I'm not what I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I appreciate you kind of saying how for you, one of the first instances of noticing queer and Asian identities was through media portrayals and it goes back to the, the lack of that representation kind of robbing us of our own inability uh, to have the language to really internalize and understand who we are. Uh, and thank you for also sharing some of the challenges that you've had with your family. And, and I totally agree that like, it is a process, right? Um, and I think my parents have come along uh, as well. Um, I kind of wanted to share uh, a piece uh, from another uh, Asian uh, queer person. Uh, and this person's name is Sam. And he talks a lot about family too, and, and, and specifically about his Chinese grandmother and how his grandmother internalized Sam's identity as a trans man. Uh, and I think it's a little different uh, on its take from what we've shared about the challenges that we've had with our queer and Asian identities. And so let's take a look and hear what he has to say. Hi, my name is Sam Long. I'm a Chinese American Canadian transgender man. I grew up in a very diverse Toronto suburb with lots of immigrant families, but also a lot of racism, I realize now. I wanted really badly to be Western, to be white, to be honest. And my last name is Long, which means dragon in Chinese. But on paper, it kind of looks like a white last name. I remember thinking that that was cool and that I was luckier than other Asian kids because I looked white on paper. When I was 16, I came out as a trans boy and I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to lose my family. They don't even have a word for that in Chinese. I fought with my mom constantly about my transition and I was kicked out of the house a few times. But after five years, my mom started calling me Sam and calling me he or him. And soon after that, she told all her relatives in China that I was trans. Turns out they do have a word for that. And my grandma even said to me on the phone, uh, just be yourself and ignore what anyone else says. My uncle invited me to pick a Chinese first name so that they would have something to call me by. And that was the greatest honor, the greatest affirmation I've ever received. I chose the name Shan Yu, which means mountain feather, strong but sensitive. 
my name is a declaration that I've embraced my roots and my roots have embraced me back. For years, I thought that my identities were like this big tangled knot and I would have to inevitably cut one thing or another if I wanted to untangle it. But then when I examined myself carefully and gave it some thoughtful, gentle tugs, it turned out to just be a simple, continuous, harmonious loop. My goodness, I was so touched by that. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing a little bit of your story with us. I'm going to like let folks sit with that for a little bit if they want to. I love that metaphor of a, of a loop and oh, the, cool. the sort of journey that Sam had as, you know, an Asian person in a white dominant society and internalizing, you know, white supremacy and, and, and white ideals and, and, looking at your own Asian identity as something negative to coming full circle and, mm -hmm. and having your family give you a name that matches your gender identity is so beautiful. And, and, and I really appreciated how that testimony pushed back this stereotype, right? That I think a lot of Asian and POC identities um, are, are assumed to have this, this inability for them to reconcile LGBTQ identities with our yeah. you know, ethnicities, uh, especially when we're navigating those cultural generational gaps that exist. And I think um, even when Sam said uh, there is a word for trans in, in, in yeah. language, I think it's true perhaps in some sense that Asian cultures and traditions have their own unique paradigms for understanding sexual orientation and gender expression that we in a Western American uh, English context don't. Yeah, because that when I heard that, I was also thinking like, oh my goodness, there has to be a word. Maybe I just don't know it. I'm unaware of it. And, um, you know, that's a lot to uh, the Western kind of even just Western education system I kind of grew up in and how I learned to use language here because I, I hate to say it, but I speak English better than I speak my native language. And, and that's heartbreaking in some ways when it comes to understanding who you are and how you exist in that like tangled knot, right? Because I, I think um, to Sam's point, I really want to get to a place where my knot doesn't, there is no knot. Things feel like a continuous loop or a continuous journey. And, um, you know, listening to Sam's story, actually, it makes me um, want to ask you this question I have for you, PK, um, around identity and how we think about like claiming our identity. And I know the word claim has some like negative connotation to it, um, but uh, I, I do want to share that in this instance, we did decide to use the word like claim so that we can feel some ownership of like how we move in our identities, right? So my question for you and thinking about Sam's reflection and even your own reflection, what does claiming your identity mean? Either as queer, as Asian, and queer and Asian at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I think a lot of it is just giving myself permission to be who I am um, and to accept that as um, a, not, not a finite point, um, but uh, an in, like in progression of getting to who I am and this feeling of coming home. Um, so for me, what it means to like claim um, queerness, to claim Asianness and to, to claim this Q&A is this the new acronym we're using? Q&A, um, miss. Um, I, I think for me what it means is, um, you know, when I do show up at my family gatherings, um, you know, I, I just feel a little bit more empowered to stand up a little bit straighter to, to see that and to say that to my family. And maybe it also means like searching out the language I need to be able to like articulate it to others in a way that could um, help me more internalize these identities for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I have some other thoughts, but I actually want to hear your reflections before I share more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I heard in your response that claiming is also tied to empowerment. Claiming uh, has an aspect of, of, of political recognition of the power that your identity has. Right. And I think there's something deeply uh, subversive uh, and, and radical about saying and claiming that you are queer, that you are Asian, that you are Q and A, queer and Asian, yeah. right? Uh, that is a rejection of, of, of these, these paradigms and structures and ways of understanding identity that, that hasn't existed. And it, it, it reminded me of a conversation that I had with uh, another uh, person. His name is, uh, their name, I'm sorry, uh, their name is Tony and they are white and Chinese and non-binary trans. Mm. 
uh, and they're an aspiring educator. And I reached out to them on Twitter and really asked about questions around their queer and Asian identity. And, and I kind of asked a similar question about claiming or uh, which mm. identity comes to you first. Um, and, and, and they didn't like that question uh, because they felt as though it assumes that we can separate our identities when mm. similar to what you were saying, Sue, we can't, right? And, and we had this wonderful conversation about the dominant ways in which we understand and talk about intersectional identities are always mm -hmm. about separating them rather than yeah. understanding them as things that are inseparably linked, that are constantly operating together, regardless mm. of the spaces that we enter that we're in are trying to erase or invalidate and minimizing one over the other. Um, right. So I actually have a quote uh, from Tony that I wanted to read out uh, and kind of share you some of the thoughts that I had around that. And, 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 and they said, uh, intersectionality is about multiple modes of power operating against a person and combining to form new modes of subjugation, indescribable mm. through the language of one or the other. Mm. Uh, and so if I'm understanding them correctly, it's that A, we could never be just queer or Asian, uh, and B, the combination of these identities uh, are, are sort of creating new meaning rather than being the sum of its part, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and that sum of, uh, and, and that new meaning is, is something that is uh, contextual. It's dependent on the different spaces that we navigate. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're always in conversation with uh, the power dynamics of the spaces that we exist in. And, and, and that made yeah. me think a lot about how, um, and you kind of alluded this, uh, Suk, in, in your conversation around identity and, and family, um, this notion of our permission to express uh, and what it means to be in a white dominant society. Right. So um, yeah, I, I think for Tony, uh, they were saying how being uh, queer and Cantonese, for instance, uh, and the societal acceptance and, and, and their ability to express that is uh, inherently um, limited by power structures. Yeah. And, and I think both of us can, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I remember when they were telling me this, I was like, yeah, that totally happens, right? We, we, yeah. we definitely can navigate spaces and feel as though we are embraced as queer and Asian people yeah. in progressive circles. But even that embracement as a Q&A person uh, is cut short uh, or is contingent. And, and for Tony, that was when uh, they are talking about uh, anti-Blackness or if they're having broader mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. white supremacy or hegemonic ideas, then folks tend to, uh, you know, pull back. Um, mm. and, and I kind of reflected on how, for me too, uh, as a teacher with a state-sponsored platform as the teacher of the year, my acceptance and ability to navigate, especially professional spaces successfully as a Q&A person is to some degree contingent on my acquiescence to that sort of like, I don't know if respectability politics is the right word, but like, again, to the extent that we are sort of always existing under the box of, of a certain paradigm, right? Our, our ability to claim Q&A is limited. Yo, that's a lot. Yeah. And I love it um, because it's percolating so many feelings and emotions in me because I think, um, you know, in, in some ways I, I definitely agree with that. And I also, still feel valid in my, my response to say like, yeah, even though the way that I experienced the, the shortcomings of being able to express and, and share my full identity, um, it's still a valid feeling because of these, these structures are still on top of us and the power structures are still as they are, as they be, whatever, um, in, in that way. And, and so I appreciate that nuance, like, idea there, because I took this question as a very personal question of like, what does it mean for me personally to be able to say proudly or, or maybe not even proudly, whatever adjective there is, but just to say, these are my identities and I will hold on to them. I will own them. I will take responsibility for them um, in the ways that they are flawed and in the ways that they are not flawed and in the ways that they are nuanced and complicated by our power structures. Um, and so I just appreciated that uh, kind of like pulled out systemic view of it because it helps to remind me that like, um, in many, in many cases, um, it's, uh, the things that folks are navigating, um, when they're trying to figure out what it means to fully claim themselves are completely different depending on the ways, um, 
you know, oppression kind of layers on to the different parts of their identity. Um, like for me, I was thinking about being um, someone who's bisexual and queer in a straight passing relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I may never need to ever come out and say that I am, but I, um, that I am um, queer because it's easier to pass as not queer and um, think about like the privileges inherent in that and uh, like may potentially be scared to claim um, that I am bisexual. And, and, you know, I've actually had that fear um, within the LGBTQ plus community that like I shouldn't come out and say anything like that because of all the privileges I have and it would never be hard um, that hard for me um, but uh, one of my friends actually said to me um, well then you are adding to your own like biphobia and your own bi erasure which is adding to our community's bi erasure and it perpetuates that system where more people can fall through the cracks and be pushed to the margins so yeah, feel free if you want to keep doing that. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. And so, you know, even in the ways where I thought I was serving the LGBT community by taking a step, like taking a step aside or like giving up some space, I was realizing that I was perpetuating some of the same ideals that were internalized and socialized within me to stay invisible. Actually, mm -hmm. that happens within my Asian identity as well. The invisibility and erasure constantly being the one to step aside or not be centered. Um, it's it's the duality right now figuring those two out this is kind of new it's just coming up for me but like understanding those two things is like what i'm trying to navigate to when it comes to like how do you actually claim this identity what does that mean yeah i also heard in your response like our broader obligation as as q a people to like the social justice movement and and i think a lot about how especially after the george floyd protests um the critiques that exist within Asian communities, especially light-skinned Asian communities, of how there's a lot of silence uh, and complicity um, in uh, the broader struggle for uh, liberation, especially for Black, uh, Brown people of color, and you know, Asian, uh, especially East Asian folks, I think. Uh, per the model minority myth, right? They were considered as honorary rights, uh, whites and that they have this relative proximity to, to whiteness and white people, um, which in its own way makes it that much more important, right? For us to kind of show up uh, and advocate for uh, racial justice and civil rights for other folks. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, TK, if, um, if Tony, or if you, um, when in your conversation, had any um, examples or things to share about how y'all are navigating the way inequity does manifest in your identity, however you choose to show up in it, um, and how you might have navigated that discrimination and or bias. Did you have, I'm going to throw it back to you, uh, <laughs> did you have a way uh, in which inequity is manifesting in your uh, identity? Um, I think for me, I, I think I asked that to get to give you the um, what's behind the question um, mm -hmm. to give you a little bit of that. It's because I recognize that I carry a lot of privilege in my Q&A uh, &A identity. Um, you know, I can I can like navigate in a way where I don't always have to be in the mental in the middle in the spotlight or be like spotlighted. And so when I ask that, I think the way that inequity manifests for me is I just take on the role of like the quote unquote oppressor by um, saying like, yeah, well, I'm in a straight relationship, I'm not a straight passing relationship, I'm not going to speak out on any of these things or, um, you know, I, um, you know, I might be fetishized, but I, at least I'm not getting killed. Um, like there, there's things like that where I'm like trying to figure out like why do I actually see these things as the either or or like the give and take of that when actually no one should actually have to be going through any of this yeah. and so any inequity that manifests whether it is um for me in in those small ways or like whatever ways they are I'm trying to figure out like um on the other side of that for my, at least for my privileges, how do I use that in a way that actually mitigates the inequities that manifest in our community where I know um, folks are more pushed out to the margins? Mm -hmm. I, you know, it makes me think of the beauty of intersectional identities and in that it makes it difficult for tap out of um, conversations that don't relate to us, right? By being queer, for instance. And so if I'm just an East Asian straight male navigating society, 
right? Um, it's easier to tap out of conversations when it comes to systemic oppression because I only approach it and understand it through the narrow lens of being uh, an Asian mm. person. But queerness by default sort of uh, challenges that narrative. And I think the beauty of a queer identity uh, and LGBTQ plus people is that they exist in every single race and ethnicity, uh, wh wh whatever that language is being used, right? Mm -hmm, uh, and, right. And, and, and so again, going back to this like, something better than the sum of its part idea, like being Q and A is, is, is sort of this wonderful thing um, that is that makes you inherently part of this multi coalition uh, you know coalitional uh, multicultural diverse community that really reminds you of the importance of uh, our liberation being intrinsically tied together right um, yeah. yeah I appreciate that too right because um, even within the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community, um, you know, who, a community that is oft, often seen as a monolith, even in its acronym, um, in many ways, um, or its multiple acronyms, um, is trying to say that, like, actually, we, our diversity is our greatest strength. And so also, like, taking on the queerness in that, and then adding that to the um, Asian uh, identity part of it means that there are more ways in which our diversity could strengthen our understanding of each other mm -hmm. and could also help us push um, uh, through different, or at least like create different pathways for people to move around. Um, and there's not just one pathway or one way to understand the community, support or show up or um, be in kind of solidarity with one another in that yeah. sense. And, 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 and speaking of solidarity and you know, the challenges that sort of bring us together because of our shared struggles. I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the solution is also within the solidarity. And I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. healing, right? And, and what that means to you as a queer and Asian person. And so do you have a suggestion for how we offer ourselves healing? Gosh, you know, um, something that I've been trying to do is just be a little bit more honest with myself. Um, uh, and it's really hard and it sounds, it's, I, I don't want it to feel like, um, just like, oh, here's a simple answer. Get to know yourself better and just be real with yourself. But honestly, that has been the hardest thing for me to do. Even coming out to myself was very hard. Um, you know, and I would go back and forth and I would like, when I was younger, I would like even make jokes about it or I would like tease about it. And then I realized like, actually, I think this is just who I am. And and me accepting me um, before anyone else could accept me, it was, it was hard, that was hard enough. And so I think for myself, the way I've been offering myself healing is just going back to moments when I was younger. And, and um, you know, I told Andrea this on another call I was on that like, I think a lot about my inner child and I try to be a mother to my, my inner child. And I say back to myself like, hey, you know, that time when you were actually deciding if you were bi and you made a joke about it and then you said, let's just like do this to see if we are bi, you actually are bi um, and it's okay. And what you were going to do there, you were exploring that and like to forgive myself for those moments where I feel so guilty for, for the ways I think I've harmed or like stopped the progress of the LGBTQ plus community. Me as like a, a 10 year old stopping the entire movement's progress, right? But it felt like that. And, and I think I have moments of like, Let's go back to those times and just like say like it was okay to, to be feeling that and you were navigating it. Um, the other thing I, I would say that's been helpful for my healing is having conversations like this with people like you um, and being able to be in dialogue um, together because a lot of times, like I said, I'm just reflecting back to myself in my journal. Um, and so uh, I think like finding more people who are queer and Asian have been really helpful too because it started to also show me the biases I had about my own identities, but I was projecting out to my peers and my communities and then helped me to start breaking those down. And so I was trying to heal myself when I was younger, but now another way I'm healing is by building community and building on understanding with other folks so that you know I start to like break down this idea of myself that like uh there's no one there's no one of us I can't connect when that is not true um as you know TK as you know when we were researching for this talk we we're like where are all the queer and Asian people and we just like found so many um and so it's it's even those misconceptions I have in myself that I'm trying to break down to heal yeah like this, this idea that healing is is, is both in 
uh, like intrapersonal, like it's sort of the self-compassion and the grace and the forgiveness that you give yourself in the internalized hatred and the internalized homophobia or transphobia that you might have had, yeah. right? Uh, and then it's ex interpersonal. We we can heal only through the reflections and others and the conversations that we have. Um, it did remind me of some of the testimonies that we've also gotten. So I wanted to share oh, one with yes, you. Yes, please uh, do. Yes. So this one is from River. Uh, and River is also a teacher. It's, they are uh, a science teacher. Uh, and they identify as non-binary Chinese American. And they also immigrated to the States in the 1990s. And so they were really, really also uh, drawn to this question about what it mm. means to uh, reflect and, and to heal and said something similar uh, to what we've just mentioned about self-reflection and rejecting our um, desire to assimilate. So let's take a look. How do we offer ourselves healing? I was in denial about being non-binary for a very long time. Uh, like many immigrants, I learned to erase parts of myself to assimilate and my parents had survived the Cultural Revolution. So they taught me that to survive, you have to put off living until it feels safe. Mm. So I think accepting my queerness really helped me heal from a lot of that intergenerational trauma too, uh, because I realized that no amount of assimilating or passing was going to make me feel safe. And when I accepted myself, I also accepted the power to choose which parts really represented me at any given time, just for now. So just as I can define my gender, I can define what it means to be Asian and queer. I love this so much. Um, and thank you so much, uh, River, for <laughs> providing that reflection because, you know, for me, um, I, I think another part of the healing is like collecting counter narratives, right? Like counter narratives to the narratives that I've been hearing for so long that like, you know, um, a simulate, a simulation equals happiness, a simulation equals like success. And I, I did try that for so long, similar to what um, River was sharing. And, and so that just really touched me in a way where I was like, oh my gosh, thank you, River. Another counter narrative that I can take with me um, and say, and say like, you know, here we're doing it already we're out here trying to figure out what it means to live counter to the ways that uh we were socialized to live yeah and i think our rejection to that assimilation is exactly what you said uh Suk, uh finding other queer and asian people right being in community and and i remember tony said something similar as well around how uh, being authentically queer and asian being able to navigate society uh, and heal uh, as a queer and Asian person can only happen outside of a white cis hetero institution, mm. right? And because, you know, for, for Tony, white hetero cis uh, spaces are built, right, upon colonial imperialist legacies. And so the rejection of that is queer POC spaces. Um, and, and only in queer POC spaces, kind of like the space that we're creating together right now, right, yeah. uh, that it's exclusive to us, can we find uh, new modes of expression and language and knowledge that our current structure that we're navigating, a white cis hetero paradigm, has denied us access to. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. I wonder, I yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I was just going to name my sighing. My sighing is like, I feel full in, in a good way. Um, and, and so I just wanted you to know that as an affirmation of your existence making me feel full. Well, I feel the same way. I, I, I think I, I wanted to sort of end this conversation about us thinking about, again, and grounding ourselves in, in, in the positivity and the beauty and the space that we mm. created and the identities that we share as queer and Asian people. And the responsibility that we have to each other to share each other's stories. Um, and so I wanted to end the final question to you with what is something unique about being both queer and Asian? What is the value add in being both? Hmm. Gosh. Um, I think in many ways um, we we are we are the counter narrative in Western society um, that helps other 
queer and Asian folks to be able to see um, where they can see themselves fully. I, I also think there's something very interesting about being queer and being Asian um, in the sense of, uh, you know, what people understand about being queer could be a lot, but what people understand about being Asian might not be as much, um, you know, and, and the reason we're doing a lot of these webinars with the Smithsonian um, Asian Pacific American Center of, in Education is to actually add more of these counter narratives to the wider narrative, right? And so a lot of times I think being queer and Asian for me, um, it feels really special because it feels like um, there is this like, this constant like storytelling as healing that we're doing. Um, and, and I think in every culture, um, at least not, Okay, I can't speak for every culture. We are not a monolith. We're over 50 different countries, over a thousand languages. Um, but a Asian folks, yeah, uh, queer folks, um, don't know how many, I mean, we have infinity languages probably. Um, but to all that, I say what's so special um, is this, this idea of traversing multiple um, communities in a way that like coalition can really be built, right? I think about when we first started this conversation about what it means to actually be in coalition with one another. And um, in some ways um, using the, uh, like when we lean into our Asian identity, for me, when I lean into my Asian identity more, there are spaces that I can enter and then bring my other identities to advocate for more folks to be in that space. Or like, what does it actually mean to, uh, to pull on um, our ancestors, like I, I think about just um, the very uh, kind of like monolithic history of Asian activists. Um, and I think, you know, we've got Yuri Kochiyama, who obviously hero, um, Grace Lee Boggs, hero, you know, Larry Itliong, like, you know, but, but sometimes when we ask folks, who else are your ancestors? Um, mm -hmm. People don't often know. And so I think there is like something that we're doing where as you're queer and Asian, you're asked to excavate parts of your identity and parts of your history and parts of your life that like maybe other folks are not excavating. And then when we share that as storytelling, it becomes healing for not just the, the Asian community, not just the queer community, but across multiple communities because there's intersectionality there. Yeah. Does that make sense? I think I'm also trying to understand this a little bit more, but that is where right now in progress I'm at. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everything that you said is like the antithesis to mainstream conceptions of how Asian identities, for instance, are understood is that like we all look the same. Right. Um, and, right. and your point on Asian and, and queer Asian identities being able to traverse so many different communities because of their their diversity and intersectionalities makes me not, you know, be surprised, and I know we've joked a lot about this, uh, that like queer and Asian folks are like super creative. There's a lot of poetry uh, and resilience 100%. and beauty in, in, in queer and Asian, and, and let's be real, in all queer people of color identities actually. Yeah. And I think it goes back to a lot of the, the earlier points that we were saying of how, of how we have been forced to find a language in a way of being that doesn't currently exist in, in, in dominant paradigms, right? Or at the very least, yeah. not really. Um, especially yeah. in Western culture. Especially in Western culture. And, 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 and part of our ability to, um, uh, to, to find out what we mean and to sort of liberate ourselves from those structures mm -hmm. is by coming to these spaces. Um, and so, yeah, queer and Asian people are awesome. We, we occupy <laughs> the world with yeah, double, triple consciousness, you know? <laughs> Um, and, 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 and yeah, like our, our, our survival, uh, story in many ways has been about community, uh, and, and trying to see the beauty in a world that tells us that we're not. Yeah. And, and to that point too, like, you know, something else that I feel like is a value add that comes from at least my, um, my Lao culture. And I've heard this in similar cultures in Asian American Pacific Islander native Hawaiian spaces is that we generally operate from a collectivist view when it comes to being in spaces together, you know, creating community, creating family. Family doesn't always need to mean blood family. And, and, and I think actually being queer, I've learned that in so many different ways about what it means to like have chosen family. And I actually think I learned that from being Asian, um, for being Lao, where I grew up and, you know, 
I think I had a thousand aunties and uncles. Don't know if they were really related to me, but I called everyone that when they were coming to my house. And similarly, um, when I came out, uh, you know, I was just fully accepted by the queer community in a way that, you know, I didn't realize I was going to be. And, and I think like both parts and, and actually both parts of one whole show me that like there is collectivism in there too that we offer up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and also our ability to sort of change name and, and reimagine uh, what, a, what a just society can look like. Um, right. And so, yeah, I, I just wanted to thank you really for kind of creating that space for me and in many ways being, um, you know, uh, uh, not only my chosen family from, from queer spaces, but just like a sort of like a mentor and sister figure in helping me understand mm -hmm. a lot about myself as a professional um, and, and specifically as a queer and Asian uh, person. And it's not lost on me how difficult it is to find um, folks who have similar experiences with you and to process that with them. And so I, I really value uh, you, uh, Suk, and, 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 and the conversation that we've had today. Oh my gosh. Likewise, um, this basically felt like I was writing a love letter to you, but in dialogue form. Um, and I hope you got that uh, feeling. And, and I appreciate um, you and your willingness and vulnerability to have us share this moment with whoever is going to view it, um, if you're viewing it right now, you know. Um, just thank you for being a part of this. I reflect that back to you. Thank you.